is a song that I wrote a long time ago and uh, just, just now recorded it. And so I had to sing it for you.
So I'm going to invite you to join in these conversation questions, and if you could get with one other person, uh, so in twos would be preferable, and take uh, time today to look at these two questions. Briefly share a time when you felt like things were closing in on you and you had no way out. How did God make a way where there seemed to be no way? Would you take a moment and talk? And I know we're going to talk with people on this group as well. So in twos, please, so that you have more chance to share. Twos if possible. Packed up and 
they had come on out into the desert, and then there they were, pinned by the Red Sea, and the Egyptians in pursuit. Can you imagine this is a song that the Israelites could have sung? It had come this far by faith, and I can't turn around and go back. I can't turn around and go back. Let's just say, in light of today's news, this morning's news, when we awaken to hear of another mass shooting, when we awaken to hear that it was a gay club, we don't know if it was targeted because it was a gay club or simply because it was a club that was wealthy people late at night. But in our own hearts, I'm quite sure many of us feel that, that fear or that potential that this was a targeted hate crime. We know that we are coming up to the one year anniversary of marriage equality in this country. We had talked before about backlash. It happens in a lot of different ways. We've seen against transgender folks and all this nonsense about who can go to the bathrooms and absolute lies being said, complete lies being said that people are trying to give permission for men to go watch girls in the showers. Complete and absolute lies, distortions. When we see all that happening and we know the freedoms that we have gained, we need to remember to give God thanks and praise for the freedoms we have gained. And remember the song that you have not brought us this far to leave us now. We've come this far by faith, leaning on our word. So we have to keep leaning on that word. And when we feel like we're between a rock and a hard place, or let's say a really wet zone, <laughs> a deep sea, that I feel like I don't want to wade into those waters because I don't know what's in it, and I don't really know how deep that mess is going to get. And I don't want to get into that, but yet you're being pursued by lies, yeah. by manipulation, by fear. Come on now, let's just pay attention to any of the stuff going on in politics right now. Yeah. Yeah. When we hear all of that stuff and feel it pursuing us, we have got to listen to God even more. Yeah. Lean on your holy word and trust that we've come this far by faith. God's not going to leave us now. Right. Is there an amen? amen. amen. So this story of, of the party of the Red Sea is part of our uh, illustrated summer series that we're doing. And so that's why you have the coloring sheets that deal with the theme. In the, uh, the month of June, we're looking at water themes. So the party of the Red Sea is a water theme. And I, I think the Holy Spirit's using it well for us because it ended up being the exact same chapter that two of our Genesis groups was on reading this week, so we studied it in depth this past week as we came to this. Uh, and then with this news, it just feels like it speaks to me about how God can part waters and help us see what we can't see another way. We don't know how we'll get out of the mess our country is in. We don't know how we can get out of the mess of the violence that the world is in. But God will make a way. The children of Israel did not see in advance what God was going to do. God did not say, this is everything I'm going to do, and this is how it's going to work out. Moses simply was told it's going to be hard. <laughs> right? Pharaoh's heart will be hard. He will keep changing his mind. But they didn't know exactly how it was going to work out. So the children of Israel were very much like us. We need to take a lesson from them. Because there's times when they had great faith. But there's also times when they turned on their leaders. Great examples of leadership oppression. We love Moses and hate Moses. We love Moses and hate Moses. And we will see that throughout the story of Exodus. So I want you to hear a little bit more of the story that happened right before the Red Sea. So we want you to come and read to us from Exodus. So this is kind of the setup right before the waters parted. This is from Exodus 14, verses 10 through 16. As Pharaoh grew closer, the Israelites looked back and saw the Egyptians marching toward them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? that you took us away to die in the desert. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt like this? Didn't we tell you the same thing in Egypt? Leave us alone. Let us work for the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to work for the Egyptians than to die in the desert. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand your ground 
and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never ever see again. The Lord will fight for you. You just keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to get moving. As for you, lift your shepherd's rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and split it in two so that the Israelites can go into the sea on the right ground. Okay, so what happened here? Israelites, they just got all this freedom. They've been saved from the Passover, the death that struck the households of the Egyptians, but it had passed over the Hebrews' homes. Uh, the animals of the Egyptians had been struck, but the Hebrews had been spared. The Egyptians had had boils all over their skin. The, the Hebrews had been spared. Ten plagues had come. They'd seen God's hand. And then finally, you can be free and you step out. And what happens? What are, what are the Hebrews, the, the Israelites, what do they say when they feel like they're pinned in? I'd rather be a slave in Egypt than dead in the wilderness. I'd rather be a slave in Egypt than dead in the wilderness. <laughs> what? I'd rather live quietly in the closet than have yeah. the world deal. And get hair parallel. Don't make a fuss. Don't think. It was better back then. Can you hear how people can make that connection? Wow, so they had freedom. And at the first sign of trouble, oh, they turn on who? They turn on Moses, the visible leader. They turn on Moses. Why did you bring us out here? We've been better to stay in Egypt than die here in the desert. Oh, it was me. They don't turn to God. They don't see a possibility that they can have a way out, right? right? So they become fickle. As I said to the Genesis groups this week, this is a story where we see fickleness that is not unlike the fickleness that we see on Palm Sunday to Good Friday. Hosanna, Hosanna! Crucify him, crucify him. Just took a few days to change their tune, right? Same thing here with the Israelites. <coughs> Why are you crying out to me? 
tell the Israelites to get moving. <laughs> so this is a be still, get moving. And you can see, like, where am I going to move to? Because there's water. But then the sea parts. The scriptures say that the wind blew all night long, and by the morning, the walls of water were there. And the Israelites moved through, get moving. Sometimes we also need a kick in the butt to get moving, even in the path of freedom that God has made for us. <coughs> we can see a path opening up, right? That it can be, um, we can be stuck and, and fearful to even move into the path of freedom. And God says to the Israelites, get moving. I think there's a real juxtaposition here of this be still and get moving. And here's what I want to suggest to us today that we need to think about. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Don't be afraid. Trust that God will make a way. But that is about the inner being. And then I think we need to let go of our anxiety and our fear. Are you hearing me? And inside, breathe, release, and be still. Stand your spiritual ground. So that the fear of the enemy, whatever that enemy is, does not move you from your place of faith. That the be still is to be anchored into that knowledge of we've come this far by faith, leaning on your word and promises, and you've never failed me yet. I, and you say to yourself, I can't turn around and go back to Egypt. That's the wrong direction. I can't turn around. We've come this far by faith, and I trust that you won't leave me now. With that inner standing of a spiritual ground and <coughs> then you physically, practically get moving towards your answer. You hear what I'm saying? It's going to take that inner stillness and that inner confidence to have the boldness to walk between big walls of water. What looks like opposition. What looks like something that could come tumbling in at any minute. But God told you to go this way. And you're like, I don't really want to go that way. Maybe. <laughs> but stay calm, not being afraid, being still here. You get moving practically. Yes, for some of you, that could even be uh, making a job change. It could be about a relationship issue. It could be uh, something else. It could be about speaking up with your family and friends, about gun violence in our country. I know there's people in this country in this congregation who carry, who are licensed to carry. I love you. You know that. You know I don't carry. You know that I don't like guns at all. But that doesn't mean I don't respect your right to carry. Right? Okay. And there's still a difference between you having that right and the kinds of safeties that we're talking about. Can we walk into those waters together? For safety for our people, for our children. Can we help educate people of that difference of hunting, sporting, and protection, and yet the access, the increased access? You know that Dallas is sitting with more murders now? This year, in June, we have more murders in Dallas than all of last year. What's happening? The enemy is approaching. But I believe God will make a way. Absolutely. And we can't just give into fear. Right. On that issue, on, on LGBT freedoms, on anything. We have to stand our ground and be still inside. But then we have to move forward. And that may be speaking out, taking action. Raising our voice. I want you to think about what does it mean? What does it for you? What's God asking you to move into? Where is God parting the waters? Where you can see that God is turning it away, where you thought there was no way, but you're still not sure if God's doing that or somebody else is doing that, and you're fearful to move, but God is saying, move. Yes. I want you to think about that. I'm going to do a time of soaking prayer. The song is going to pray at the play. You can. Sing with the song if you want to. We're not going to leave it. It's just going to be there for the book of Tabernacle Park. Um, 
um, you could do some of the coloring as prayer, but I want you to not, this is not a time out, this is prayer. It's about being in God's presence, and, and instead of telling God everything that you want to tell God, I want you to listen. The song is saying, lead me, Lord, I will follow. So can I ask what the song was saying earlier? Lead me, Lord, I will follow. Maybe God's leading, but you haven't got moving yet. Maybe at one part of the equation trying to be still inside, and then the voice of God will say, and get moving. So I want you to listen to where God is saying to move today. How is God telling you to move in the world, in your life, in, in the different issues in your life? See where God is, is making way. So I want you to be in prayer, meditation, listening to the voice of God, whether you use the color, whether you use the song. Listen, and invite God to speak to you this time. Let's pray. Amen. And God can give you the courage to step out in faith. In June, we're also looking at who we are. Who we are as individuals and who we are as people. Who we are as a church. And last week we talked about uh, the statement, we are progressive. And today I want us to consider the word participatory. We are participatory. So I invite you again to turn to someone beside you to uh, talk about this question. What does that mean or say to you? And is that who we are? Are we a participatory congregation? Would you take a moment to talk about that word and that statement? What does it mean to say to you? Is that who we are? taking a few moments to share with each other. You'll notice on your tables that there is a little survey form there too that has some questions about words you would use to describe the church and some words that are important for you and I would ask that you fill that in today. Leave it. There's no place for your name. It's just an opportunity for you to give some feedback um, to the board and myself. So I'd ask if you fill that in at some point. You know this word participatory uh, comes up because it's something that we've been really working on in the last year and a half. And even having some conversation questions in the middle of the sermon is a way for you to participate in engaging the Word of God in the worship service. And that's what we've been trying to work towards. You know, the Christian church was initially, worship services were highly participatory, that the word uh, liturgy actually means the work of the people. That's the translation of it from the Latin. It's the, it's the work of the people. And so liturgy, the coming together to worship, everyone would contribute to the worship. It evolved, particularly in Western culture, it evolved to be more of a performance art done by the professional or hired uh, religious people, otherwise known as the clergy. 
to a digital front. In our modern world, it's become even more of a, an observance or a entertainment evangelism, if you will, entertainment worship that uh, many churches have with the, uh, ex excellent musicians and praise teams, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it has become very much that there was a show put on at the front that other people watched. And we see a hunger around the world, actually, not just in the, in the United States, but in a world that is so digital, in a world that uh, we interact in different ways, even pushing a button to say like, that worship needs to be more interaction and more participatory. And so there is that movement in some circles to make it more participatory. And that's something that I've been trying to do with us here, to participate in different ways. Uh, of, like I say, using the conversation questions, uh, involving different people in different ways in which we worship. Um, even having the coloring available is a different way that you can participate rather than sit passively and simply receive something. You're engaging in something. And uh, some of you like to and some not. Um, I can say specifically that it's been very, very helpful for people that have ADHD. What is it? ADHD and ADD. Um, we used to have someone that attended our church who would knit all through services. Do you remember that? And somebody thought, someone thought that that was really strange as someone was knitting. But it helped that person actually focus and really hear better so they could do something with their hands. And so for some of you to doodle where to color actually helps you focus better and hear the word. And so it becomes a different way that you get to participate. Sometimes uh, there's something that comes even off that piece of paper. Uh, some of you may have seen Cheryl Jordan's post last week about how the coloring spoke to her later as she saw images emerge of it as she colored. So then it continued to raise other pieces around the text that we haven't even talked about here, but it raised more things. There's lots of different ways to participate. And I'm talking about participation today different than use your spiritual gifts or sign up for a ministry. So don't worry, there's no sign-up sheets today. <laughs> this is not about volunteers in the church. This is about us really participating in our own experience. In other words, when you come to worship, what do you bring? Do you bring your whole self to actively participate in that? Or do you come ready to be entertained? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you come to consume, or do you come to contribute? Do you participate in your own uh, spiritual journey? Are you waiting for someone to feed you, or do you seek out spiritual food? Do you participate in a Bible study, or read a devotional, or uh, uh, listen to Christian music at home? Ways in which you engage with God or participate in your spiritual health and well-being on an ongoing basis. Do you work out spiritually? Notice a scripture that says uh, physical exercise is useful enough, but spiritual exercise. Do we utilize uh, our own abilities to get moving? So you see there's a connection. The children of Israel had to do something. For their own freedom, they had to do something. First they had to leave Egypt, right? And then when they got to that Red Sea, they had to participate. God parted the water, but God did not go and move them to the other side. Yeah. It wasn't magic. It becomes a partnership. Spirituality is about a partnership yes. that we are invited to participate in. So God parted the waters, and the Israelites could have said, uh uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, no, no way. Right? I suspect one or two of them did say that. <laughs> And then have some encouragement from others. And that we need, that's another way we participate, is to encourage one another. But they did have to participate, being still inside, but get moving. And they had to step up of faith. They had to do something. You have a dream, you got to move towards it. Let's just say get a plan, and then what? Work your plan. A plan by itself is no good. But we have to participate in it. Once you hear these two scriptures, shall we? Sorry, caught you snacking. Different participation. But that's another thing. You know, we don't realize that we have people in our congregation that are diabetic and they have to eat at regular times, right? Right. Somebody says, well, I can't believe somebody would be eating in the middle of church. Well, you know, is there anything in scripture that says don't eat during worship service? <laughs> is there anything in scripture that says don't knit or don't color? No. It's just like being present to the spirit, amen? 
So we participate in all kinds of different ways and take care of ourselves. Listen to, listen to these two verses. The gifts God gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. First Peter 4 through 10. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. So just take a look at those scriptures. And again, it's not about signing up for a ministry. There's many ways in which we need to do things automatically without there being a church program. Do you know what I mean? Without there being uh, an organized thing and somebody's in charge of it. It simply says, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another. It doesn't say, wait till the leader speaks. Serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. The world needs us. <coughs> the world needs us. Our comments on Facebook matter. Our prayerful presence on Facebook matters. Yes. You can be a witness. You can be doing evangelism by sharing a prayer or a positive response to something. Or we can become the hypocritical Christians that pray on Sunday and condemn and judge and whatnot Monday through Saturday. Are you hearing me? But we can serve the world. We can serve one another with our gifts. Gifts of prayer, gifts of service, gifts of kindness. And go back to that other text. Everybody please, Eric. The first three. Ephesians. Thank you. I want you to notice that the second to last phrase. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. So different people have different gifts, and that's all about spiritual gifts. But it is to equip who? The leaders. The saints. For the work of ministry. That's you. And ministry doesn't just happen in the church. It happens in the world. This is the practice lab. This is the equipping lab. But the real ministry happens up there. And it doesn't have to happen in programs. That's probably where I sound different than a lot of pastors. Because a lot of people try to organize a church program and then keep statistics on it. Right? And go, look at us. And that's where it ends up being about ego. The truth is, I want you to live as a Christian in the world every day. Yeah. And the statistics we end up keeping are when we mess up, honestly. Those, those are glaring. I don't know all your small victories. I can hear some big ones. You probably know some of your own small victories. When you got going, you had a positive response. But this is how we participate in our faith, is in everything. We learn, not just for ourselves, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So when you have some of those, those uh, gifts, we share with each other. Some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We have all that in this church. And we share it with each other to equip you for the work in the world. Why? Because that builds up the body of Christ. Yes, yes. And it builds up the body of Christ with no definitions about denomination. It just builds up the body of Christ. So we want to build each other up, and we do that by participation. So I want you to imagine those children of Israel and the ones that had the doubts. I'm not sure I could walk through those other walls of water. And yet some of them say, yeah, you can. Come on. Freedom's on the other side. Come with me. Can you imagine someone taking the hand of someone? Can you imagine someone who was already tired and weak from slavery and, and someone else saying, I'll help lift you. I'll help carry you. Take my arm. We'll go together. Yes. And they participated. They stepped out. It started with God. Moses took his lead as a leader. He held out the staff and did what God asked him to do. But then the children of Israel stepped out and together, together, they made it to the other side. Together they made it to the other side. And that's what we can do. The other side of violence. The other side of discrimination. You know, I just, uh, while we were praying, I checked there and uh, that club that was hit last night was having a Latin-themed night. The layers are thick, people. Let's not forget that there's a lot of anti-Mexican in particular, anti-Hispanic yes. uh, discrimination going on in our world right now, in our country. Layers are there. But together, we can go through those waters. Together, we can encourage one another. We can participate in our faith and encourage one another and build up the body of Christ. Will you? 
Will you be participatory? I pray that you will. And have the courage to get moving where God is leading you. Amen. I think I'm going to skip that song.